From the Beth Israel, the West Temple, on Trisket Road in Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome back to another town hall meeting. We are so honored to have with us this evening the county executive, Armand Budish, to talk about a variety of matters. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me. We're very me. pleased to have you here. My pleasure. Tell us what a county executive does. What's the first priority for you in the morning when you get to work? Uh, that varies every day. Uh, right now, my first priority just about every day is how do we attack this terrible epidemic, pandemic that's going on? How do we protect the citizens of Cuyahoga County? How do we help them survive this, this uh, uh, both health-wise and financially? Um, what can we do to make their lives better? And that's really the issue that I look at every day, even pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. And is that through the Department of Health? Is that Who gives you your information? Well, we have a great Board of Health. Um, uh, people who have been there a long time that have been uh, tremendous during this, uh, during this crisis. Um, you know, they've been working 24-7 for a year. I mean, it's hard to believe how much work they do. I don't understand how they maintain, you know, how they survive. They're, they're doing what they, what they have to do to keep us all healthy. First it was testing and it was uh, contact tracing and uh, now it's vaccinations and, you know, they're out in the mornings, they're out noons, they're out nights, they're, they're weekends. Yeah, they're doing the work that we all need them to do. And, you know, there are not that many of them, uh, and they're, they're working their butts off. And how do, how do you, as the county executive, how do you project that, what you just said? How do we get that out to the general community at large, how, how wonderful the time that they put in? How do, how do you expound that? Well, we try to get the word out all the time. I mean, unfortunately, people generally don't have any clue what the county does. Uh, people know what the city does, they know what the state does, they have no idea what the county does. And we try to get that, we try to communicate. We, we send out notices to the press, we send out, you know, we do social media, we do um, uh, press conferences, we do press media avails, you know, all kinds of stuff, but um, it's very difficult to get the word out, especially now when so much of the media is focused on negative uh, reporting, uh, so that because apparently that gets more interest, more clicks, more uh, more audience. It just makes it harder for us to get the word out on all the positive things we're doing as a county government for the people in the county. And that raises an interesting question that I I've been thinking about since I was told that you would agree to come on this show, and that is being a public official in an era where it seems easier to throw stones than to just listen. Does it eat away at you sometimes that you, that you can't get across the positive things and everybody appears to be so negative? It's, it makes it much more difficult. I, I, you know, you know, you, you know, I know, my employees know the good work that they're doing. Uh, and then they read about how, you know, they're horrible. And, uh, you know, they're not horrible. But, you know, it, it's, it's demoralizing. Yes. Uh, thankfully, we have very good employees uh, throughout the county that do it because they care so much. You know, we have people, for example, uh, we have our deputies that, you know, protect us in the, in the county. I point because one of our deputies is here tonight. Um, you know, they protect the community. They they protect um, uh, the the you know the, the, the you know people who are uh, prisoners. They they you know they're out there helping people all the time. We have social workers in our department of uh, department of children's services that go into people's homes even during a pandemic to protect when they get a call to make sure their children are protected. Um, you know, we we have people who are risking their lives during a pandemic to make sure that that 
people get the services they need in this community and they do it because they care and that's what's so wonderful on January 6th which is I believe eight weeks ago today where were you when you first saw what was going on at the Capitol I believe I was at the office what were your first thoughts uh, I was stunned that this sort of thing can go on in the United States of America, in the Capitol, in Washington, D.C. I mean, I, I lived in Washington for a number of years, and I'm familiar with the Capitol, and, you know, it, it's been open. You know, it's not, it's not, not a, a fortress. You know, people can go in and out all the time. And we want it to be that way. We want people to be able to talk to their representatives. We want people to see how the government works. And we don't want to have to have fences up and, and security all over the place and armed guards. But you know, we also can't have what happened on January 6th happen again. Is it f fair to at least look at January 6th as just another anecdote in the separateness of the American public, not just on political grounds, on grounds on lots of issues. It just seems that we're very separate at the moment. Is that fair? Well, we are divided. Completely. Divided. There's no question about that. Um, and the last uh, four years have seen us get more divided. And I attribute that in part to the President of the United States that we had for the last four years. I don't want to get too political, but Correct. Uh, you know, it, it's a fact. And, uh, and I don't believe Jan January 6th was an anecdote. I think it was, uh, it was an intentional effort to uh, stop the next president from being elected and coming into office. And there are two other events I want to ask you about. One is Charlottesville person dies, gets run over by a car, and the president comes in and says there's good people on both sides. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. What do you think that effect on the American public was, that, those kind of comments? I think it's terrible. I think it's terrible. You know, I think that the president uh, was way too supportive of uh, you know, white supremacists and the Ku Klux Klan and other hate groups uh, that were at the Capitol on January 6th, ultimately. Um, you know, the President of the United States has to, has to be above that. And, uh, you know, even if, regardless of who's in that office, that office is something special. And, you know, we all need to come together when a president is elected. Um, I mean, I wasn't a huge fan of George W. Bush when he was elected, but he was our president. We all needed to come together. I felt, you know, clearly, you know, we all needed to come together around Barack Obama when he was elected. Uh, you know, it, it, we can't, we can't, uh, you know, continue to fight a campaign years after the election's over. And that's what we've seen here. And the other event, tragic event, was the murders at, in Pittsburgh at the, at the temple on a Saturday morning. Mostly older people passed. Um, do you remember where you were when you heard about that event? I don't, I think I was at home. But um, you know, that's another example. You know, it's very sad, anti-Semitism is alive and well and living in the United States and we have to be on alert at all times. And we cannot stand by and be quiet. Even those of us that you know, you know, we can't, you know, we don't want to be political about things, but, uh, you know, we can't stand by when there's anti-Semitism going on. It's, it's scary. We've seen what happens, you know, with, with World War II and uh, the events around that period. So when the governor 10 months ago, don't quote me on the exact number of months, was coming on TV almost every day, I think most people were supportive of what he was trying to do, lead the state. And then we had the Jewish woman, Ohio Department of Health, having protesters at her home right. when she came home. 
Two questions. One, have you ever faced that at your residence? That type of community anti anti commissioner, uh, chief there executive. There have been efforts to uh, to um, uh, come to our home. Yes. Is that right? And is that what the sheriffs are there for? To That's one of the purposes. Yes. Yeah, and everybody has freedom of speech. It's in the First Amendment. It, I mean, it, 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 it's the Fifth Amendment. It's the super important one. But doesn't there have to be some protection of somebody's ability to enjoy their home as well? Well, free speech doesn't mean violence, and that's what we've been seeing. You know, uh, you know, attacking someone uh, is not speech. And um, I want to. Uh, digress for just a second because you mentioned the governor. Yes. Um, and I have made my views clear on our last president. I want to also make it clear that um, I have found Governor DeWine to be tremendous in his response to the uh, pandemic. And he's the other party for me, but he has done a really solid job. Uh, I think that he came out of the box uh, strong. I think he saved a lot of lives in the state of Ohio. I think his health director was excellent, uh, Dr. Acton. And, uh, and I think he's got other good, very good people around him. Uh, he has been very supportive whenever I've called him. Even though I'm a Democrat, he responds immediately, he listens. And in many cases, he's taken action based on what I've asked him. He's, I, I, I just have been very impressed. So this state of ours, the great state of Ohio, has urban areas that are very blue, and the rest of the state is as red as red as your tie or as red as my tie. I, I I asked you about this before we started. Do you sense that the opportunities to have any of those areas change colors is almost zero? No, I don't think so. I think there's constantly changes that occur, uh, both within Ohio and we've seen it in, I mean, who would have thought that Georgia would vote for two Democratic senators? I a mean, Jewish guy, too. A Jewish guy, too. Uh, so, you know, it, things do change. And uh, part of the reason that Ohio is so red is because of the, uh, the shameless gerrymandering that went on uh, almost 10 years ago now, yeah, 10 years ago now, um, in both the uh, state legislative districts and the federal legislative districts. I mean, generally speaking, Ohio has been viewed as about a 50-50 state. That may have shifted a little more red, but it's not, you know, it's not as red as you think looking at the makeup of our legislature. But, you know, for a 50-50 state to have, uh, to have eight Republican people in Congress and four Democrats is, is ridiculous. It's, it's 12 and four, I'm sorry, it's 12 and four. 12 and four. Right. When you take on your role as the county executive and you're a Democrat, does it have any effect upon your ability to call the adjacent surrounding counties or even to call Cincinnati's county executive, H how does that work? D does the label I'm a D play a role in, in how you communicate with your fellow leadership? Well, I uh, am regularly in contact with um, my colleagues, my counterparts in uh, all the major metropolitan areas because we're on a weekly phone call, wow. uh, especially around the pandemic. We uh, talk about what we need from the state and then we together call the state and ask for help on what we need. Wow. Uh, we um, talk about other things, we, what we need from the state budget. We talk about uh, uh, you know, what, what kinds of laws could help us do our jobs better. So uh, we're constantly in touch with the other metropolitan areas. Uh, and I happen to be also the secretary for the uh, County Commissioners Association of Ohio, uh, which is made up of commissioners from everywhere. and. We work together, and you know we don't agree on all the specifics of policy, uh, but we do agree on a number of things, and those are the things we work on. So let's um, step back from your current role. Talk a little bit about how you came to your role. How many years have you been a lawyer? I've been a lawyer. I 
became a lawyer out of college. I went to law school and uh, graduated uh, in 1977. And what law school? From New York University Law School. And when did you think maybe politics was in my future? Well, I always thought, I've always been committed to public service. Hmm. Um, when I went to NYU Law School, I went through a program called the Ruth Tilden Scholarship Program, which was designed for people who are interested in public service. Um, so I, this has been a long-standing commitment. Um, and I've all, off, I, for a very long time, I felt that th I could do more for people through government service than any other means. So I was ready to go into government back when I graduated from law school and came home. But uh, at that time, I was also married and uh, soon had two children. Uh, and uh, my wife said to me, <laughs> uh, Armand, I know you, but you give everything you have when you want to do something. And if you go into government now, you will give everything you have. Uh, and you can do that, and I'll support you. But I also know that if you do that, you can't do everything. So you can either be a very good government public servant or you could be a good father. Uh -huh. And at that time I chose father. So I practiced law, I converted my law practice into an elder law practice so I could help seniors. I felt good about that, felt I was doing service. Uh, and I looked for other ways I could do public service. So I started writing a newspaper column for the plain dealer, You in the Law, the consumer law column. I wrote a weekly column for 24 years, wow. uh, every week, without missing one. <laughs> uh, uh, that column led me to become a contributing editor to Family Circle Magazine, the largest so-called women's magazine in the country, uh, and uh, to writing a regular column, becoming a contributing editor to the AARP's Modern Maturity Magazine. Uh, that led me to write three books. Wow. Uh, on aging issues to help people get through the issues of aging, which I also felt was service. Uh, and that led me to start a TV show called Golden Opportunities on N the NBC Channel 3 here in town, which uh, I did for quite a while. Um, so I felt I was doing a lot of good public service. Uh, and my wife was saying, you should feel good about it, and I don't think you need to do government, <laughs> but I always still felt that government would give me the opportunity to do more. So in 2006, I decided to run for state representative, and I won. Uh, I did two years, and then decided that I could do more if I could become the leader, so I ran for and won to be the House Speaker. Uh, at that point, the Democrats for a brief two-year period, took the majority in the House, uh, and which allowed me to be the m speaker. And then two years later, in 2010, the Democrats got wiped out statewide. And my caucus became the minority caucus, but I stayed as the minority leader. Uh, and then in uh, 2014, my terms were up. Uh, and I came back to Cleveland and decided to run for and became the county executive. So when you're a legislator, not only that, but the head of your whole side, the Democratic side, did you live in Columbus? It's, uh, Cleveland Columbus Drive is a long drive. Yeah. And when I got to Columbus in 2006, 7, January 7, um, I knew I was going to be spending a lot of time in Columbus. I wasn't the leader at that point, but uh, we did purchase a condo down there uh, just so it would be easier than lugging back and forth all the time. And, and I ended up spending three, four days a week down there in Columbus, and I had clothes and stuff there, and, uh, and then would come home on the weekends when I had time off. Is that the norm for the most of the people that work at that level at the le legislature of le no, legislative that average? that's not the norm. That's not the norm. Uh, you know, first of all, most people have uh, 
uh, uh, full-time jobs that they have to do while they're uh, serving in the legislature. Um, and uh, in addition, most, you know, I waited to run for office until my kids were out of the house. Uh, most of the people there are not like that. So for me, I could afford to buy a condo at that point in Columbus, and I could uh, afford to take the time away from the house because I was, you know, childless at that point in uh, in Cleveland. Did you enjoy being a legislator? I did. It's great. And at that time, both when you were in the majority or your side and not, how how do you get along with those who don't agree with you politically and still get things done? Well, it's most of the time it's not easy. Uh, we come from very different backgrounds uh, around the state and uh, our beliefs and our philosophies and our passions and uh, are, are very different. And I will say the biggest difference is not Democrat and Republican. The biggest difference is urban slash metropolitan and rural. And that happens to correspond in many cases with Democrat and Republican, but the fact is that, that it's, it, I found that it was the geography that played a bigger role than the political uh, persuasion. And it, w did you get a, a feel for this? Because I've seen that. I work for a small town out by Sandusky. And these small towns, leadership and the people, is it, f I sense that they think they're not getting a fair shake from the local government, the state government, the federal government. Whether it's true or not, I'm not sure. But they seem to think they don't get a fair shake because they live in a small town. Nobody thinks they get a fair shake. Okay. Everybody thinks that they're uh, getting the raw end of the deal. Um, when I was in the state legislature, we did a study of where the state money went, and I can tell you it did not come to Cleveland. <laughs> the state money went all over the place, but not to the Cuyahoga County. So we were not getting a fair shake, and we're still not getting a fair shake. We send so much more money away than what we get back. Um, if we got back the money that, you know, just a per capita, we wouldn't have to worry about taxes up in Cuyahoga County. We'd be rolling in dough. That's the difference is significant. Wow. Uh, I mean, you take the gas tax, for example. That's a simple example because, uh, you know, we all pay tax when we buy gas. Um, Cuyahoga County buys a lot of gas. You know, we, as an urban area, we are driving all the time. Uh, we pay a lot of gas tax. The money comes back 188th per county. Every county, it doesn't matter if you got a million, 200,000 people, or you've got 20,000 in your county. Everybody gets the same tax back on the gas tax. Just an example of the unfairness of how the money is redistributed. You sound like Brexit, <laughs> right? It's, it's a Brexit versus the European Union. How many people work in, in the county government, per se? It's probably around, well, it depends what you call county government. In, in the administration side, it's probably between 4,000 and 4,500. And it's impossible to know them all. Do you think you may know all of the, depa all the department heads? I appoint the department heads. You'd appoint the department heads. Right. So I better know them. You better know them. And we have a, a one individual at the head of our county how many other counties in Ohio are structured like that? So we have a county executive where uh, we have, there's one executive. Uh, most counties have a county commission system like what we had before with three county commissioners and an elected sheriff and an elected recorder and an elected uh, treasurer and you know, on and on. Um, there's 86 counties that are still in that position. There's only two in Ohio that have an executive. So it's unusual, the setup we have here in Ohio. But I will tell you that I've gotten to know people. 
my colleagues from all over the country, and the county executive system is very common in other places around the country. Before I turn the page on my notes, I, I had something written down, and I wasn't sure what I'm gonna ask it, so I'm gonna ask it now. The prior president of the United States and the current president of the United States have both determined that the visitor logs, who comes and goes at the White House, is, n is not public business. Nobody has a right to know who comes into the White House. Does that offend you? I would need to know what the rationale is for that. I don't know whether it's a security issue or, uh, but you know, generally I favor transparency. I mean, we are fully transparent in the county. Uh, as you can see from all the uh, media attention we get, we're totally transparent. Media attention. It, it seems like there are times when there is just a big target on your back. Whether it's you like say all the right, the time. I'm sorry? It's all the time. All the time. Did you expect that? Uh, n certainly not. Um, you know, I'm, I'm focused on doing the work. I'm focused on uh, serving the people of our county. And I know that sounds corny, but that's why I took this job. That's why I took a pay cut to take this job. I was doing very well as a practicing lawyer in my, uh, in my own law firm. But, um, you know, I, I, I was raised to believe that it's our obligation to help people that need the assistance. Tikkun olam. And I believe that in my heart. And that's what gives me satisfaction every day when I wake up. And every day when I go to sleep, I look back and I say, did, what did we do good for people today? And thankfully, most days I can list a whole lot of things. Describe how you communicate with each municipality. Now I know in the council of government that we have, there are, I think it's 12 or 11, I forget the number. 11 county councils. 11 councils. How do you, communicate with each of the major cities or even the smaller cities in our county? Well, we meet with them. We talk to them. Uh, today, this morning, um, we had a meeting of the economic development directors uh, of the cities. Uh, we have 59 cities in Cuyahoga County. Wow. And uh, Zoom is wonderful, and you can Zoom all 59 at once, and, uh, and that's what we did. Um, there were a lot of mayors on that call. There were a lot of economic development directors on the call. There were other uh, city staffers on the call. And uh, that's a way we can communicate and explain what's, what we're doing and what's available, how we can help better. We, it's how we get feedback on what we're doing from the cities. And, and it makes us better. So how does politics come into play when you're having that sort of meeting. How does, it, how does politics play a role in what you do? When I'm doing my government work, we don't do politics. Um, I can tell you that if you look at you know, where we put the roads and bridges, if you look at where we're investing in small businesses, if you look at um, uh, you know, where our health and service health and human service uh, uh, attention goes. Uh, it has nothing to do with pol politics. I mean, we can put a road in East Cleveland or we can put a road in Bay Village and it's based on factors that have nothing to do with politics. And I don't, I think people agree with that. I mean, we've never been accused of, of playing politics with government uh, activities. Are there areas I think your seventh. This is your seventh of year, correct? Beginning this of your seventh my, year. Yeah, beginning this. Uh, beginning seventh year. Yeah. Are there are there still areas that frustrate you that we can't do better at as oh, a county? Oh sure, lots of things. What are those? Oh, I mean, <laughs> how long do we have? <laughs> um, you know, we're. Wh uh, let me give an example. We yes. we are working very hard uh, on improving economic development and we're doing that all the time. Uh, we wanna bring businesses here. 
we want to grow businesses here, we want to train people to work in the businesses here, uh, and, uh, and we do a good job of that. I'd like to do more. Uh, we've got projects that we're working on. Uh, unfortunately, government doesn't always work as fast as I would like, having come from the private sector. Uh, I am used to things going faster, but there's a lot more requirements and things you have to hoop, hoops you gotta jump through in government. Uh, so things take more time. But uh, we, as an example, we announced yesterday that we are uh, introducing legislation to the council to create a series of what's called a microgrids around the county, uh, which will allow us to provide the fast, the, the most reliable electricity uh, in the world. Where you may have seen, for example, in Texas recently that the electricity went down and it caused terrible pain and terrible damage. Um, and in many places in Texas, it's still down. Um, with the microgrids, we won't ever have that. <laughs> we will be able to guarantee businesses that come into Ohio, come into Cuyahoga County, uh, when they hook up with the microgrid, they will uh, be uh, uh, have their electricity running no less, uh, how do I put it, the, the grid will not come down for them any more than five minutes in a year. It's 99.999% reliability, and uh, it's, it's fabulous. I think it will be a tremendous, our, our, our best economic generator that we've ever created here in Cuyahoga County. The problem is I had this idea three or four years ago, and we've been still working on it. We're getting close. As I said, we introduced the legislation yesterday, uh, but uh, it's frustrating that it's taken that long when I know how this is going to work. So when you say we introduced the legislation, is that your office or your office plus all the other councils or the councils? How do, how, how do you work with your geographic other well, this members was, of the this council? This one was our office. Your office. Uh, it, we introduced it to the county council, and they will debate it, consider it, and vote on it. And does most legislation start with your office or come from them to you? No, no. Most of it comes from our office. That's, that's a, an administrative function. And are those council full-time employees of the, of the county? Some <laughs> of them make it their full-time job, but it was supposed to be a part-time job, and they get paid like a part-time job. So uh, I think a number of them have other jobs, but some of them, this is all, yeah. this is their job. I think we've talked about the frustrations and the difficulties that you may face. What's the, what are the couple or three the best things this county does? We do so much good. You know, I, 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 you know I, when we started this, you asked me what I wake up and think about yeah. you know, now, and it's, it's, I told you it's the, how do we help people out of this pandemic, yeah. out of this crisis? And what we have done to get people through the pandemic, I think, is nothing short of, of fantastic. Um, when it first hit back in March of last year, uh, we immediately set up our emergency operations center, which brings together all the cities and, uh, and, and police departments and fire departments and EMS and everybody that provides emergency services, and they all coordinate out of the EOC. Uh, we, uh, you, you may recall that we were, that everybody was short of, of personal protective equipment, PPE. Mm -hmm you know, the face masks, the sanitizer, the, you know, ev everything that's needed. And you couldn't get it. You just couldn't find it. And people were telling us, the media was telling us that uh, eventually we'd get plenty from the national stockpile. Well, I didn't believe it, and I didn't want to wait, and I knew that our people couldn't wait. You know, we have people, as we talked about, doing very dangerous things, you know, working with people that are getting poor, COVID, and we had to get PPE out to people. So uh, it wasn't easily available, but I got on the phone myself for a solid week, mm -hmm. and I called my colleagues that I've met over time around the country, and I said, do you have any leads? Where can we get PPE? 
and uh, we got some leads and I had my staff follow up and we ended up purchasing lots of PPE and we did it early and then we got donations of PPE and we got lots of that early and uh, long story short we were probably the first out there to do what we did in terms of getting PPE for the residents of this county for the people who need it uh, we distributed over probably by now maybe 14 million items of PPE oh my Lord. we still have we collected another 10 million that's in storage for this year because we know it's not gone or even going away immediately uh, so uh, we we snapped into action we we were we worked with urgency and uh, and uh, intentionality uh, we we saw that people needed to be tested so you know there was a lot of testing going on from hospitals and, and other facilities uh, but we also noticed that the minority community was getting left out that there were a lot of people that were not getting the testing that they needed uh, so uh, I talked to our Board of Health told you they were great uh, we partnered with them we partnered with Metro Health Hospital we as a county invested five million dollars to purchase 30,000 more tests and Metro Health went out to minority communities, people who are not being served, and we tested people. Um, we filled the gap, and we did it well. Um, you know, businesses all over the county were facing closure. Many of them did close, and uh, we had to do something, especially small businesses. Uh, so we we invested millions in uh, in making grants to small businesses. We helped probably. 1,500 small businesses around the county uh, to keep open. That was, I think, tremendously important. Um, the New York Times was reporting how we were facing a tsunami of evictions coming. People who lost their jobs that couldn't keep their apartments and, and didn't have the money to pay rent. We needed to do something. We put millions into rent stabilization uh, and we helped 4,500 people stay in their apartments. Uh, I think that's fabulous. Um, you know, we put a lot of money into the food bank and the hunger network. We put, you know, kids' schools were closed. And if schools are closed, you know, they went to remote learning, which is fine if you, you know, live in Beechwood, like I do, and you have easy access to the internet. But 25% of Cuyahoga County families don't have any access to the internet. And how do you learn in a remote school situation if you don't have access to the internet? So we provided, I don't know, something like 20,000 laptops. We provided uh, service. We, you know, we, we teamed up with service providers, internet service providers, to connect them to the internet. Uh, we helped a lot of families with kids, uh, uh, enabled them to continue their schooling. And I could go on and on. You know, uh, I think our response to the COVID ep pandemic has been nothing short of fantastic, and, and, and I think we saved lives. And the and the the answer really is there is a time when government has a role to play. No question. No about question it. about it. No question. You know, people. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there's been this trend towards people saying, you know, we don't need government. You know, small government, shrink it, put it in a bag, and throw it down the toilet. I mean, you know. Uh, government has a role and we've seen it in upfront and per up close and personal this year yes uh, and anybody who thinks government doesn't have a role is is missing the boat so let's talk about a, another hot topic that no pun intended that came around we had Tamir Rice in this community and then last Memorial Day weekend late May we had a nation that reminded me of 1968, 1969, 1970. When you first saw what was happening downtown, what did you think? Well, if you're asking what I thought about the protests yes. uh, in Cleveland, yes. um, you know, as long as protests are kept peaceful, I encourage it. I think that people have a right to express their views. But it's got to be peaceful. And what we saw when gang of people 
broke windows throughout downtown and, and you know it caused all kinds of damage that is not acceptable and uh, so you know it depends on what when you talk about what did I think it depends on about what well know. when you saw that the damage being done to the I'm just going to say East 12th to Tower City Courthouse Lakeside Avenue when you saw the destruction of property that's a better question what do you do wh when you first saw that type of conduct well my I was constantly on the phone with the sheriff uh, the sheriff got his deputies out there and uh, they were uh, our job primarily was to protect the Justice Center I mean you know that was sort of the initial focus of yes. the protests um, we had you know, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 people in the jail, in the Justice Center. If those protesters had broken in, it could have been awful what could have happened. So uh, our deputy's first responsibility was to protect the Justice Center, and they did that. Uh, and uh, so that was my first focus. And then when I saw what was happening around the city, uh, you know, we don't have the primary responsibility or authority to keep peace in the city. That was the city, the police department. Uh, but uh, when I saw what was happening, I also was involved in uh, in uh, trying to get the National Guard to come in uh, through the governor, and we were able to do that. And if I remember correctly, there was a breach at the Justice Center. They actually made it inside, is that correct? No. They, they broke a lot of windows, and but there was stories about them getting inside, but they didn't get they inside. They didn't get inside. And so the long-term effects on our community, is long-term already over? It'll, it'll, it's, it's March, it's 10 months away, 10 months since that's happened. Have we, have we won the, is downtown gonna be okay from your perspective? Yeah, I think downtown is gonna be fine. Um, I don't think the days of protests are over. You know, people are still getting killed. And uh, police sometimes use excessive force. I mean, you see it every day on some news report. And uh, so protests will continue, and they should continue. Just need to keep them peaceful. When you see a Black Lives Matter sign, what do you think? I think, again, it depends where and what the environment is but I think yeah it's good people are keeping it in the in, in the public eye the idea of defunding the police how do you respond to that well you know I think that's a misnomer um, the purpose behind the quote defunding the police is making sure that there are resources devoted to alternatives uh, to jail and to policing and you don't have to defund the police to do that um, we are putting significant funds into a diversion center, for example, a place where uh, police can take somebody who they believe you know, has mental health or addiction issues, and that's why they're acting out. And if they're not violent and they're not hurting people, uh, they can take them to this diversion center and they can get the treatment they need without getting into the criminal justice system. That's the goal. And that's what we're doing, and we didn't have to take money from the police to do that. How is your relationship with the mayor of the city of Cleveland? I think my relationship has been excellent with the mayor of the city of Cleveland. Um, uh, we work together on a lot of things, um, and I think we work well together. And when you speak with other county executives, informally or in your capacity as the secretary of the group, do you find that our general good things and bad things are somewhat what every other city is going through? Every city goes through similar similar issues and problems. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, different different counties react differently sometimes, but that depends on your resources and your leadership and et cetera. But um, yes, we all face the same issues in many many ways. And in this COVID environment, how much of a county resource have we lost? You know, we're just, we're a couple of weeks short of 52 weeks. Has there been a loss of economic 
real numbers to the county because of COVID? <laughs> hey, that, you're oh, you're yeah. laughing. <laughs> Our chief source of revenue is sales tax. Okay. Sales tax from small businesses, sales tax from restaurants. You know, when you walk down the street, do you see booming s retail and booming restaurants? If the answer is no, then you're like everybody else because it doesn't exist. And that is an indicator at what's happening to our revenue for the county. Um, we also have obligations to pay for the hotel and the convention center and other things. We have debt service. And if nobody's staying at the hotel and nobody's coming to conventions, the money isn't there from those facilities to pay their debt service and property tax. So the county has to pay it. So the answer to your question is we've lost a lot of revenue and we have uh, uh, had to incur additional costs due to the pandemic, just like other businesses have uh, suffered and, uh, and we have to cope with it. One of the things that has helped us a lot was the CARES Act or the first uh, uh, stimulus package that was passed in 2020 and we're hoping that Congress is on the verge of adopting a second big stimulus package that will help us for this year and potentially next year. So uh, the federal government's been a big help. And do we think, how do you, how do you take the scales of, well, if we just open up and let people come downtown or do we just open up businesses, let's just relax a little bit of the restrictions, we can make up the sales tax. How difficult is it for you to think about opening up when we're, as of today, how difficult is it to think about, maybe we should just loosen up. Other communities are loosening up, why don't we loosen up? If you're asking me, do we weigh opening up to get sales tax revenue yes. versus protecting the health of the community, yes. it's an easy decision. We protect the health of people first, and we will handle the economic crisis, uh, but we can't fix people who have gotten sick and died. So uh, that's our first priority, first, second, and third priority, the health of this community. Um, doesn't mean we stay closed just to stay closed and we're doing everything we can to come out of this which is why I'm constantly talking on, in the media about wearing masks and uh, and to social distancing and sanitizing and washing hands and because that's critical to us keeping the virus down and uh, and getting back to a normalcy but uh, most important is the health of our people that live here I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it. When you read about Mississippi and Texas, are you just shocked at the idea of being mask free? Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, w we know masks work. I mean, it's 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 been proven. It's not it's not debatable. Yeah. It's not a political issue. You know, it's it's not a political issue. You know, I I know that. People don't ever like to be told by government what to do. We had this when the governments decided to require people to wear seatbelts. I knew you were going to say that, yeah. yeah. But we got, around, we got over it. We learned to wear seatbelts. It wasn't a political issue. It's not a political statement. You know, it's, uh, you know we, a lot of restaurants and buildings decided that, you know, and the government, you know, you shouldn't smoke in, in close quarters since it's not healthy and it's not <laughs> good for other people. We didn't want to be told don't smoke, but we came, we, we, we adjusted. It was the right thing to do. And that's what the masks are. And to tell people not, you know, to lift the ban on masks, uh, the requirement to wear masks is, uh, is wrong, especially in places like Texas where they're suffering so badly. You know, it's so obvious just from the 50 minutes we've been together that you truly do love your job, don't you? I do love my job, and I love it because we're doing so much to help people in this community. And if I didn't feel that, I wouldn't enjoy the job. I put in way too much time, and I take way too many criticisms in the newspapers, and you know, I wouldn't do this if I didn't feel that we were really accomplishing uh, good things for this community.
you know, I'm a baseball guy, and a lot of the baseball players that aren't drafted in the first round, their comment is, if I could just, just make it to the show, you know, just be one of the 150 that could make it to the show. And their ambition is to get there, they just don't get there. When you sit back and think, oh my gosh, my ambition, it, it's, it's happened. I, I'm where I thought I might be. Do you think about where, where you were 25 years ago and where you sit now? Uh, yeah, I guess, but you know, I, again, I, I told you that my ambition is to help as many people as I can a and do it as deeply as I can. And I felt I could do that through government and now I feel like I'm doing that through government. Um, so, yeah, I feel good about where I am. Sure. But only because we're doing those things that I thought could be done, and uh, now we're doing them. So every politician gets asked this, so I have to ask you, is the current job the right job, or is it even possible to think of expanding your network beyond just one county in 2022? Uh, I have made no decisions about 2022, and I'm not going to make any decisions about 2022 yet. Um, right now, I am just entirely focused on 2021, and uh, we have a lot to do. And you know, I can't, I can't start thinking about something else. So I've always finished these interviews with a few personal questions. When was your last vacation? Ask your wife, right? <laughs> <laughs> Last vacation was about a year ago. It was right before the pandemic. Ah, uh -huh. where'd you go? Uh, we went to Disney World. And did you made it back before? Before? We, oh yeah, we, we didn't even know that there was going to be a pandemic. It was in December, January. Something yeah. Like that. And I know what your favorite ice cream is. Someone already told me that, but I'll let you tell the world. <laughs> your simple favorite ice cream is? I happen to be a vanilla guy. That's what I heard. Not even hot fudge sundae on top? No, you don't. If you put something on it, it takes away from the vanilla. <laughs> Do you have a favorite car when you were growing up that you loved to drive? Favorite car? I just like to have a car. I was fortunate when my mother got tired of her car and she would give it to me to, to yeah. drive. Favorite we movie we star? We weren't wealthy, and I did not get my own car ever. So. Favorite movie star? Favorite movie star? It could be two. Uh, there's, you, know, you probably don't have much time to watch movies, but if, if a Frank Sinatra comes on or even anybody you want to name. Now or back as a kid? You can give me both. Uh, I happen to like Adam Sandler. Very funny Jewish guy. Hanukkah song, the best Hanukkah song ever. Very maybe. good song. Yeah. I um, went to like his uh, recent song on Saturday Night Live when he came back, his I Was Fired. If you haven't heard it, go on YouTube and look up I Was Fired on from Saturday Night Live. He's very funny. If you have an opportunity to talk to high school students about public service, what do you tell them? I strongly encourage it. People need to be involved. Even having gone through the criticisms and everything else, you know, if, if we don't have good people in public service, you know, we're, we're goners. I mean, you gotta have good people doing these things. And it's gotta be our young people coming up. And so when I speak in high school, now I do say to them, there's lots of ways to do public service. It's, and there's not one route to public service. My wife has been a big advocate of for that, and I believe in it. So, as I said, I was doing public service writing a newspaper column for, mm. for, for consumers. I was doing public service doing a television show for seniors. Um, there's not one way to do it. You pick the one that fits you, but uh, that's what I tell high school stu students. You know, there's a thing we, we both learned as lawyers that we always knew, but you realize it after a while, that our word is everything. Our word is our greatest asset. Integrity, telling the truth, and people knowing that you brought the truth to them. It's critical to being a public servant, isn't it? It is absolutely critical. Yeah. And, you know, we, 
I worked my whole life to try to build my reputation for integrity and honesty and uh, and that's one of the reasons that it's hurtful when I see in the media attacks that I feel are totally unjustified um, and which tarnish my reputation uh, incorrectly but that is what we have and that's what we have to continue to have is our honesty and our integrity and our uh, and our word is our bond you know this is been extremely enjoyable for me. I hope it was enjoyable for you. Just very the fun. opportunity to, to meet a public official of your stature in an informal setting, although we're in a, a holy <laughs> site. It, is, it has been just a wonderful experience to have you speak openly, and we greatly appreciate you stopping by. I know you haven't been home yet, and you live a half hour away. It's, it's been a great joy to have you here, and I want to thank you very much. Well, I appreciate being here. I know the rich, talk about public service, the rich history of this uh, congregation, uh, especially in the area of service. Uh, yes. You know, whether it was saving Russian Jewry or, uh, or fighting you know, anti-Semitism locally, it, you know, this congregation has, has you know, is, is really remarkable, and so I'm thrilled to have been able to come. Right up there, right behind us. On behalf of Beth Israel, we thank Amun Budish for joining us this evening. Next up, next month, will be Dr. Sylvia Rim, talking about all those children's books that we read to our kids when we were young. We thank everybody for their time. I hope you've enjoyed this hour. I'll be directing services Saturday morning, right up here at 1030. We hope you can join us. Good night, everyone.